This information display tells of a memorial to martyrs that stands just over there. They died terribly for their faith in a different time. A lot's changed, but today I want you to hear their voices. If you're interested in the people, places and events in Scottish history, then click the subscribe button at the bottom right of the screen and ring the notification bell to find out when I upload new videos. In the meantime, let me tell you a story. I say time's changed, but the very landscape has changed. I'm told that back then, on the 11th of May, 1685, the mouth of the River Bladnoch ran far closer to the old church. That's a place that we'll come back to later in the story. But to tell you the story, I'm going to take you half a mile south to where that river empties into Wigton Bay today and where our story will take us. I have to walk, but please stay with me for just a minute or two so that I can give you the background. You see, the story that I'm going to tell you happened in the killing times. In 1638, Thousands of Scots had signed the National Covenant. It's what started the War of the Three Kingdoms, what some of our cousins might think of as the English Civil War. Now, I've made videos on the Covenanters and who started the English Civil War. Spoiler alert, it was us. A quick oversimplification. There was conflict between church and state as to who had priority. Charles I, and then his sons, Charles II and James VII, thought that the state, in the form of the king, should have it. Good Scottish Presbyterians thought Christ's church had supremacy, and in spiritual things, kings were just members of the congregation. Like you and me. Thousands signed the National Covenant to make the point. Charles II himself was forced to sign the covenant before being crowned King of Scots at Schoon. I've actually got a video that covers the significance of that coronation. Down here in Galloway was Covenanter country. But once Charles II took the throne in England, he felt powerful enough to renege on the oath that he'd given to the covenant in order to take the Scottish throne. And that spelled trouble. Straight away, he passed the Abjuration Act of 1662, rejecting the 1638 National Covenant and the 1643 Solemn League and Covenant. There was a spiral of persecution, refusal to cooperate, ministers thrown out of churches, open-air services, more suppression, uprising, military crackdowns and executions, till by the time Charles II died in 1685, he'd taken many souls with him. People could be asked on the spot to swear the oath of abjuration and for the treasonous rebel who refused, which all good Presbyterians must, the consequences were deadly. That's the background to events surrounding the 11th of May 1685. So what led up to it? Gilbert Wilson of Glenvernock in the parish of Penningham, around 10 miles north of here, he was a gentleman of good circumstances. He had a well-stocked farm on fertile land. You could say he was comfortable. He and his wife conformed to the religious orthodoxy of the state. That is to say, they attended the Church of Scotland, but unlike some of the more radical covenanting elements, accepted the Episcopalian impositions of bishops by the king in London. But his kids, they were a worry. Margaret, not quite 18, Thomas, less than 16, and Agnes, barely a 13-year-old child. They weren't prepared to accept the idea of royal sovereignty over the church as their dad was. To these children, it was a matter of faith. These were dangerous times to have beliefs like that. So like many others, they had to take to the hills. Living in bogs, hiding in caves, wandering over the Carrick, Galloway and Nitsdale hills. Children trying their best to stay warm and live off the land. Living underground 
in more ways than one, hoping that somebody would give food and aid. But their parents couldn't help them. Despite his conformity, their dad had been fined for his children's beliefs and alleged misconduct. On top of that, he was warned that to harbour or provide for his own children would lead to the most severe punishment. Soldiers, up to a hundred at a time, were quartered on his property and free to take what they wanted. He was harassed and taken to court, so that by his early death, any wealth that he had was gone, and his widow had to rely on the generosity of family for survival. Now, when Charles II died, repression seemed to slacken just a little. The fugitives felt just a little bit safer. Agnes and Margaret left the hills and ventured here into Wigtown for a visit. They came across Patrick Stewart, who they thought to be a friend. But this acquaintance proposed drinking the new king's health, knowing that the girls, who chose to live exposed to the elements rather than deny God his place, would politely refuse. And so their antagonists went straight to the authorities, informed against them, and brought soldiers to capture them. They were thrown at the thief's hole, where they languished until they were taken to the toll booth. There, they met Margaret McLaughlin, a 63-year-old woman held for the same crimes of refusing to take the oath of abjuration and insisting on attending Presbyterian services and prayer meetings. At trial, they were accused of attending religious meetings in homes and out in the open moors. More than that, these young girls, an elderly widowed lady, stood accused of having taken up arms against the king at the Battle of Airds Moss, 70 miles away, when Margaret was 13 and Agnes was 8, and at the Battle of Bothwell Brig, 90 miles away, when they were a year younger. They were, of course, found guilty of these ludicrous crimes. And so a 63-year-old woman, an 18-year-old girl, and a 13-year-old child were condemned to death. On the 11th of May, 1685, they'd be tied to stakes below the flood line at the mouth of the river when the tide was out. As the tide came in and the sea level rose, they would slowly drown with the approaching high water. Gilbert Wilson managed to get his younger daughter out on bail of a hundred pounds, from which she absconded, and for which he suffered for the rest of his days. But the day came for his daughter Margaret. The two women were brought out from the town, guarded by troops. The elder woman's stake was fixed further out in the bay, so that young Margaret would watch her slowly die and be terrified into taking the oath and renouncing her faith. As the life drained out of Margaret McLaughlin, they asked young Margaret Wilson what she thought of her fellow martyr struggling with the pangs of death. She replied, what do I see but Christ and one of his members? Think you that we're the sufferers? No, it is Christ in us. For he sends none a warfare upon their own charges. And she sang the 25th Psalm as the waters rose to cover her. But before she was quite dead, they pulled her up and they held her out of the water as she gasped and spluttered for air. She was asked if she would pray for the king. The teenager answered that she wished the salvation of all men and the damnation of none. Some of her relations nearby shouted out to the officer in charge, Sir, she has said it! She has said it! When he came close and asked her to take the oath of abjuration, she refused, saying, I will not. I am one of Christ's children. Let me go. And they let her go.
The martyrs were buried in Wigtown Old Churchyard here. The current church was erected 170 years later, but you can still visit the martyr's gravestones to the north of this Wigtown Old Kirk in the place assigned to criminals. On the edge of the town, on Windy Hill, there's also a memorial. I don't have a religion myself, but if you're ever in Galloway, why not make a stop and take a thought for folk who sincerely died for theirs? We've had too much of it in our history. There's a video with more information about the Covenanters coming up on screen now. If you want to support the channel, then click top right and become a Patreon member or buy me a coffee in the description below. In the meantime, I'm your dog is going to be a lamb alive. Cheerio and